Well, I uh, chopped down the giant sunflower today. The Mongolian giants are starting to mature, getting ready for their blooms. They're getting a little top heavy. And I think the soil has been a little dry as well. And so a bunch of them are drooping. Uh, I have some bamboo poles here that I'm going to use to stake them up. I've just done one here to demonstrate what I'm going to do. I didn't even use a tie for this one. I may go back and tie it, but I just kind of pushed it gently through the soil and draped the sunflower across it here to where it's supporting it. It was drooping a bit more before I did that. It's a little cold now. We're in the middle of September. We hit lows of 50 last night, but it's going to pick a little warmer up next week. Uh, we're in what we in Georgia call the false fall. It's uh, a stage between summer and fall where it plays around and pretends like it's fall. It heats back up. It does this almost reliably every year. And so we're in that brief phase here where it's getting cool, but it's going to rebound. And so the plants might be a little stunted from the coolness, but it's been warm today. And so it's probably just some dryness. Uh, we had a lot of rain the past few days, but then not yesterday or today. And just that fast, they are starting to dry out. And so you can see I'm running my drip irrigation system that I installed recently. I unfortunately don't have a video for that. That was the last project I made before I started my channel as I decided, you know, I should start my YouTube channel. I had just done that. It's a simple irrigation system and all of it is wired up around my base area of operations here. You can see various heads depending on where they are. There's this one that disperses throughout kind of evenly. And if you look at the ground, you can even see the line of saturation where it's already drawn, you know, a night and day darkness there. Just a, a tour of my garden real quick, since I haven't done that yet. Uh, I have some dragon's tongue beans growing here. They're a beautiful heirloom legume variety. They're quite versatile. You can use them as green beans, sugar snap peas almost. They're not quite as sweet as sugar snap peas, but they're still quite edible and, and tender and juicy. Uh, you can let them grow out to where they dry out and they become a dry bean that you can later rehydrate and use as baked beans. And so they're a very versatile bean. You can cook them up as refried beans and make them into burritos. So anywhere up the chain from green beans to snap peas to actual whole beans, all in an heirloom plant. And my favorite thing, what led me to this variety actually, I planted some blue lake green beans. And even though they call them blue, the green beans are the exact same color as the leaves, are the exact same color as the stems. And it made picking and finding the ripe ones tedious and annoying and if you know anything about me you know I don't like tedious or annoying and so these beans are more versatile than the the Blue Lake bush beans they're still a bush habit they're quite productive and they have the benefit of really standing out look at this beautiful fruit here look at those brilliant colors there's no mistaking or wondering where the beans are I could go in and harvest these and I will have some of them but with it being late in the season, like I said, it's, uh, it's late September, about a week until the end of the month. And so I'm going to let these ones go out to seed so I get some dry beans so that I can save seeds to plant next year and also to have some dry beans. So I'm mostly done with harvesting the, the green beans this year from them. I'll harvest a couple for stir fries here and there, but most of these are going to be let go to seed. And the thing is, legumes actually add nitrogen to the soil up to a certain extent. Once you, they flower and fruit, they then start depleting. And so I will need to replenish the soil some, but they use much less nitrogen than other plants, say corn and tomatoes, other non-legumes. All of these over here, these big leafy vegetable plants, these are an amaranth that are good for their leaves. I'm letting some of them go to seed as well. Uh, they're a multicolor spinach variety and you can see some of them have more red than others. Some of them have more green. Uh, planted next to them, which looks almost similar, is this basil plant, uh, a sweet basil that I've been plucking at. It's, it's one plant that's just extremely bushy, and every time it tries to go to flower, I pluck it and don't let it go to flower, so it keeps producing more leaf. 
and then those try and flower and I pluck them. You can see a few here starting to flower almost. Got a couple little buds in the center. And so in a couple days I'll come out and pluck all of those and encourage more growth. Uh, I don't use all of that basil. Some of it just ends up in the compost or as a mulch. But the important thing is it keeps producing. So when I am ready to just harvest the whole lot of it, I can cut the whole plant, hang it out to dry for a day, put it on the food dehydrator, crush it, grind it, got basil powder. And all of this amaranth here, this Chinese multicolor spinach uh, from Baker's Creek Seeds or rareseeds.com, this has a high protein count. It makes your food an interesting purple without imparting really any taste, you know, if you cook with it. Uh, you can boil it and steam it. You can eat the, the fresh leaves as you would spinach. People who are sensitive to the uh, the acid in spinach, oxalitic, uh, oxalitic, uh, something along those lines. Uh, that acid, that people have some people have sensitivity to, it can cause pain, etc., uh, you'll have the same sensitivities with these, but you, that can be eased by cooking it, steaming it, etc. Do your research. But that's why I've got a lot of that planted that is added to salads. I've got a gigantic eggplant. There's actually three eggplants there doing all of this. And one white eggplant. And you can see this thing is just massive. It was planted according to, according to square foot gardening practice, where I put one in each square foot. But as you can see, it is just taken over. It is not in one square foot anymore. It's more like, I don't know, what, what's that? A four by, no, about three by three, so nine square feet from that one plant there, that giant one. And you can see all sorts of little eggplants on it. And a lot of these will be ready to harvest soon. You eat them best while they're small. And I've even let a couple of them go to seed as in over-ripen, over to where I'm not going to harvest them. They're, they're gross, just so that I can save their seed. They're an heirloom variety as well. The name escapes me right now, but I know they were an heirloom. This was where I had tomatoes planted earlier in the season. And once I harvest them, I went ahead and dropped in a whole bunch of bean seeds all throughout, just to hold the soil in place, act as a cover crop, give me beans that I'll save. And then I can all use that as a green mulch and green compost matter at the end of the season. And then on the other side there, I have radicchio, another heirloom variety. And it's just getting big enough now to start heading up soon. I'm expecting heads to start forming in the next week or two with them. Uh, I have red hot chili peppers, and as you can see, a bunch of them are starting to ripen. And so I will actually pull those soon, the ripe ones, and move them into the kitchen, hang them to dry. I actually don't put these in the food dehydrator. I just de dehydrate them whole, hanging them, and we keep the house fairly dry. And so I let them naturally dehydrate, and then that way, whenever I go to use them, I can use the entire whole pepper, cut it up into pieces, or rehydrate it however I want to use it. Unlike the jalapenos, which I just get so many, and I don't have as much luck drying them in the same manner, they have a lot more moisture content, I feel. These are already kind of Whenever you pull them off and they're right, they're they're thin and kind of waxy and the, the very flavorful, and so I don't have any problems drying them. I don't get like mold on the inside or things rotting while they're hanging. But with the jalapenos, I've had that problem. The jalapenos, I run through the food dehydrator until they are brittle to the, to the snap. You bend them and they snap instead of bend, and then at that point I grind them up in the blender and turn them into a fine powder and put that in a jar. Uh, sometimes I use a hand pestle and mortar, uh, and every time I run it through a sifter or a sieve and pull out all the large stuff and throw that back in the grind in the blender and blend it, and I'll do that a couple times, and if there's still anything left that isn't there, then I'll put that in the pestle and mortar and see if I can hand grind it any better. And if that doesn't work, that finally gets put in the compost or discarded, depending on what it is. But most of it gets turned into a, a pure dried jalapeno powder that'll keep for years if you keep it in a cool, dry, dark space. It's a great way to preserve your your peppers, your jalapeno peppers. One tablespoon is, I believe, 10 to 12 jalapeno peppers, and so all it takes is a little dash to add a lot of heat to a dish. My wife uses it in almost everything. Uh, you can see here a lot more bush beans 
and I didn't exactly measure. I just kind of popped them in here and there. I didn't have great germination with the testing of the beans. A lot of them kind of mushed out. And so I overplanted here, but it turned out to be just right. That's a nice thick carpet of beans. And interspersed between them, I've got carrots. And these are a uh, black nebula carrot. The, the whole thing should be black inside and out. Uh, extremely rich in anthocyanins, which is an antioxidant. And so, as I said before, my goal here is not what they sell at the supermarkets. It's nutritious and delicious food. And this has been described as a sweet and not too carroty taste, a good juiciness, which is what I like in a carrot, and rich in anthocyanins. And so I'm sold. Let me have, let me sign up. And so what I did with them is I just kind of sprinkled them throughout here. And also in that bed over there, I sprinkled some throughout in the base. And so I'll just, I'll let them grow up. Uh, I'll harvest some after it gets cold in the wintertime. And some I will actually let go to seed. All of these are an heirloom variety. And I will let these carrots go to seed. Not all of them, you know, I'll eat some, but let them naturally scatter their seed so that then when they pop up, I'll let them go. And that's why it's really important to be able to recognize seedlings when they're young and know what's a weed and what isn't and not just destroy everything that pops up, especially if you run an heirloom garden that you allow to self-seed. Yeah, letting things go to seed and disperse their own seed and reseed and pop up is a necessary consideration for sustainability. I don't want to have to buy my seeds year after year after year. I want to be able to harvest my seeds and preferably I don't even want to have to do that. I want seeds that will self-seed, that will survive the winter if they need to and go to seed and disperse. Yeah, as I had said, I just dispersed these carrot seeds throughout the bed in kind of a natural pattern and I'm going to let some of them go to dis go to seed and disperse themselves. And that's why it's important to be able to identify seedlings and not destroy them before you know what they are. Uh, especially if you're going to be growing an heirloom garden where you let things self-seed. Now if I were to come out, and I will do this as well, uh, come out and save some of the seed that it puts out intentionally, harvest them and keep them separate and, and plant them again next year myself intentionally in specific places, it's less important to identify the seedlings, but still important. But in order to grow and harvest the seeds and let them grow wild, I have to be able to tell what's a carrot versus grass and wild uh, clovers and other things that might be popping up and to keep it relatively weed free. And that's part of why I plant everything as close as I do is these beans only have another month, maybe six weeks left in them before they start dying out from it getting too cold, if that. And so I'm not plucking any very little green beans from it. And the ones I do are the newer ones that it puts out. I'm letting it go to seed where these pods are going to enlarge and dry out and produce actual beans for me to harvest uh, both to plant and to use as baked beans and then once I cut them out underneath their canopy is carrots that have been snaking up through and getting ready and they'll grow even through the cold season up until probably you know, probably all spring they probably won't die out they're a cold hardy variety and should do well and in fact carrots get sweeter if they're exposed to some chill. These should do well for me as succession planting in place while filling the available space. If you look in there there's no room for any weeds to set root. There's no weeds in there and I, I have to come through very little in this garden bed. Even throughout here look at how thick this is and, and how I achieve this I sprinkled the seeds on the surface as if they were scattered by the wind, uh, spaced every few inches throughout, and allowed to do their own thing. I had previously cleared this bed. This used to be a Roma tomato crop. Uh, I grew it over the summer. I, I pulled that up, raked it all up, kind of tilled with a steel rake, not a deep tillage, not enough to kill any earthworms that are in there. I wasn't chopping the soil up. I was just raking out any clumps and allowing any decomposed material to settle and fall in. And then I topped it up with fresh compost. And then I scattered the seeds on top of that and then scattered just a little bit more of the sifted compost, which I'll have a video about soon, 
uh, it, as part of my whole... I, I'm going to have a whole series on compost. And Sifted Compost is going to be its own video in that series. And so follow along for that. Uh, but in the meantime, just know it's sifted. It's compost that has been sifted to a fine grain, a quarter inch diameter or less, or graded through it. And so there's not a, a whole lot of huge chunks, and it's very nutrient dense. And so I topped that on top of the, the seeds, just a little dusting of it, and let it do its thing. Watered it daily for the first week or two, and now I water it when dry. Uh, as of right now, it's actually kind of, it's it's been two days since it rained and it was dry today so I watered today and here's you know the back view of these Chinese multicolor spinach there's way more greens than I or the missus can eat we pluck off the plants and the next day it looks as if we hadn't taken any and so I probably overplanted, but I wasn't sure and they're they're good the eating with the pink is kind of interesting because it does stain food it's almost like beets with the the, the, the pink in there and I'm not sure that these pinks are anthocyanins. I'm not sure what the dye base is. And so it's a little interesting. I don't know that I'm going to go with this variety again. I'm going to save some seed from it so I have the option to. But I might explore other spinach-like green varieties. I've heard Egyptian spinach is a good heat-tolerant variety. And so I'll probably grow some of this, but not near as much of it next year. And then I'll try some other green varieties. Uh, you can see here, these are some other carrots that I've planted. These are not the nebula. These were planted earlier in the spring and they're getting pretty large now. Some of them might unfortunately be woody. Uh, I'll have to check them and see. They haven't quite gone to seed yet, so they're still in there. I'm hoping... I pulled a couple out and ate them and they were all right, but a little on the bitter side. And so I'm hoping that whenever it starts cooling down here and we get a couple cold nights, they will uh, sweeten up as it starts converting the starches that it's absorbed into sugars to store and get it through the winter. That's my hope here. That's what people say happens, and we'll see. I'm not letting any of these guys go to seed. I'm not sure if they were heirloom or hybrid, but either way, I don't want them infecting my, my beautiful nebula carrot. So I'll eat these, but they're not the variety that I'll be saving seed to seed, and so I'm, I'm not going to let any of them go to seed out of this crop. Another couple shots of these beautiful dragon's tongue beans, an heirloom variety, and how easy it is to see the beans that are ready. And you could just come through and pluck them. And the, the more you take, the more prolific it becomes, so they say, as with many legumes. But as I'm getting towards the cooler season here, it's almost it's it's just a couple days into fall, and so it's gonna get too cold for them to keep producing. And if I keep taking all of the ones before it has a chance to go to seed, I'm not going to have any left to seed. And I planted all of the ones that I had, so I need to save seed. And I like to save seed from a variety of sources. Uh, ones from the, the most colorful pods and also the most colorful seeds, just for variety. And over beside me here, uh, next to the road, I have a buddy in the landscape business who oftentimes cuts down trees and, and cuts down a lot of lawns and brings me lawn clippings, all of those in the bag were from him. Uh, I never bag mine up. I immediately throw them in compost or make a compost if I don't have one going. Uh, but he brings me bags and bags of, of yard clippings. He used to have to pay at the dump to dump his yard waste. Meanwhile, I had just bought a truckload of compost, five cubic yards, and it was almost $400. And that one truckload of compost filled this one bed and almost filled an 8 by 4 bed over on the other side of my yard over there. It almost filled it, and I ran out of $400 worth of compost from these two beds. And I was just like, geez, this is, this is not sustainable. I, by the way, I apologize for the, the clutter here, and really need to clean and bury it up. Uh, that plastic came actually today as I unwrapped the bamboo poles to stake. You can see I actually went through and staked up a couple that had been leaning at the start of this video. But uh, but the point is, I had just spent almost $400 on a truckload of compost, used it up in an afternoon, and didn't have all of the space planted that I wanted in just these two beds I was starting with. And I was a little discouraged as a gardener. I was like, it, how is it this expensive? How does anybody, how do you save money gardening like this? And the answer is you don't. 
And so I kept researching, and I'm like, people are doing this. Especially a lot of poor people, I myself included. I'm a computer programmer, and I have a house, but I have next to no extra income. Uh, We're on a single income for me and my wife, and it just barely pays our bills. And so I'm looking to cut corners wherever I can. And to me, gardening is a way to do that. I get market fresh, farmer's market worthy, you know, Instagram picture worthy harvests for next to nothing. I spent as much as we spend at a typical once a week or once every eight or ten days, maybe, at the grocery store on seeds at Baker's Creek. And I have enough seeds now to keep myself busy all of this year and all of next year. And I'll be able to produce untold amounts of food from that. Talking hundreds of pounds of food. Possibly more. Some of these, you know, the, the, the larger the squash and the watermelon varieties and things like that that are 20 and 30 pounds each, you know, we might hit thousands of pounds. I don't know, you know. And so, all for the cost of a single grocery trip. And now, with my friend who brings me the compost, I get this whole pile here. This whole pile, and you can see I've used some. The whole the pile isn't quite ready. I've let this one get a little too dry. Uh, and so, you might ask, why am I listening to this guy and taking his, his advice on compost when he can't manage the pile? Well, I'm, I've been doing some experiments and seeing what happens and how to fix it and how to, to change and adapt. And so I'm letting it get to different consistencies intentionally, knowing it's going to be a little bit slower. But a gardener is an, at foremost an experimenter. For every living plant that a gardener has to show, there's a dozen plants that died back behind it. And you see the successful ones. You see the ones that take root and take off and do great. You don't see the failures because we don't dwell on them and we don't let them overcrowd our life and we keep moving on. And so part of that is learning from your mistakes and learning how to stop making them and do better in the future. And to know that, you have to make some mistakes and the first few, the first eight piles of compost I made with my buddy since he, he and I have been working together uh, turned out fantastic. But then I went away for a, a vacation and I came back and I was sick and I didn't, I had thrown out my back after that and I, I just didn't turn the compost for almost a month and I came out and it was just bone dry and it looked almost like it had the last time I turned it a month ago. Nothing had changed. And so that got me to thinking and I got to researching and I figured out what the problem was and I fixed that, pro- that one. But now... I have let it get to various other degrees so that I can run a a few more experiments, see what else I can do to amend it and get it better. Because I used a lot of that last batch as mulch. I didn't get as much finished compost out of it as I would have liked. So I sifted out the usable compost and used it, and it wasn't as much as I would have liked out of it. And then what was left was still grass-like and hay-like or pine straw-like. And I used that just as a top dressing mulch on areas that needed mulch and it all got used but it wasn't as effective as I would have liked and so I I did research later that gave suggestions on fixing it and I have a couple of my own ideas see the problem when it gets dry is the nitrogen is going to bake away either way whether it's moist or dry when it's moist you support these bacteria that like that nitrogen and will ingest it and then use it and consume it and it becomes part of that that dead tissue in there and stores it. it I, I can't give you a, a great detail on all of the fine intricate details of the process but basically you are sequestering nitrogen in the, the greenness of the stuff you put in into the carbon. There has to be enough carbon to absorb that amount of nitrogen or it gets too hot and stinky and the process goes sour. Uh, And there has to be enough nitrogen to to feed and cause the chain reaction and the heat within the carbon. And there has to be enough moisture for the bacteria to survive in. Once it gets too hot, it pretty much boils away all of the moisture and gets dry and just kind of kills everything. And also, if you ignore the pile for a month like I did, 
it gets bone dry on the inside. Even after it rains, it could be raining all day, but even if it rains all day and you dig through it, it's dry on the inside, and so you have to turn it and moisten it. But by that point, all of the, if you've ignored it for a month like I did, all of the nitrogen that was in there has escaped, not all of it, but a vast majority of it, a, a great percentage of it, has escaped your pile into the atmosphere in the form of nitrogen gases. You now have a giant pile of carbon here. That doesn't make it useless. You can do one of two things. You can add it to another pile as a form of carbon, but think of it as a, a higher nitrogen than normal carbon. And so it's a brown with a hint of green instead of a solid brown. That'll make sense if you watch all of my composting videos. But you have to put it in a new pile and rebake it and reinsert nitrogen into it because it's lacking. Or you can use it as a top dressing mulch or just mix it in as organic matter to the top few inches and kind of till it in in place. I prefer using a rake or a little hand tiller unless I'm working at a large spot, in which case I'll, I'll dump out a wheelbarrow full and run the rototiller over it just to mix it in deep. And that's generally only if I'm starting a bed for the first time and not, not improving and adding to existing beds. But you will then also have to fertilize in that position, either a 10-10-10 or even just like a 30-0-0 something to add some extra nitrogen in there. The 10-10-10 is probably your best bet. And in fact, it might be a good idea to just mix some of that in throughout your pile before you distribute it. I don't subscribe to the wholly organic paradigm. I use some chemicals. I use some fertilizers that might be considered synthetic. They are effective. They are oftentimes produced as waste product in other facilities, and there's no indication that they cause problems here. I, have, I don't apply them at a strength enough to experience. Some people have, have described uh, earthworm die-off or other insects. Uh, I, I only apply a little bit and mix it in, and then use it sparingly I don't douse my stuff in the, the fertilizers and so I'll, I'll show videos on that over time whenever I get to fertilizing again but the point is every gardener has a different paradigm and every gardener has a different set of beliefs and they, they want to do things in a different way I like controlling how I grow them and I try and use as natural compost as possible if the compost system fails you or you fail the compost system as in my case then there are ways to amend it. And that's all I'm saying there is you can amend it and make it better and then use it and plant directly in it after. All I'd have to do here is moisten it and turn it a couple times, three or four times, and it'll start to break down a good bit more. I've used some of it, you could see the chunk missing right here out of it, as a top dressing mulch for my sunflowers. My sunflowers were putting roots out of the side, you know, three inches up above the ground, kind of like tomatoes do sometimes, just begging for more soil. And I didn't have ready compost available, but I had this stuff, which is a somewhat ready compost. The center was baked pretty good, so the center should be weed-free. The outside, the weeds may still be alive, uh, the, the grass seeds and such, so you have to be careful with that. I peeled a layer to the side and got to the core, which was still dry at this point. Uh, but used some from the core as mulch. But the exterior shell has grass seeds mixed in it, I, I can almost guarantee, and they may still be viable at this point. And so it really needs to be baked in another compost pile, added as browns in the pile, and mixed in with fresh greens. And unfortunately, the bags that I have over here are also in the, they're in the same state. They've lost all of their nitrogen. And you can tell, because they're in the same state, they're the straw color, uh, they don't have the rich browns and darkness that they would have as if they were decomposing properly, and they don't have the, uh, the greens available, the nice rich nitrogen to feed this anymore. If I moisten and turn the pile and measure it the next day, it might hit 108 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's barely anything. That's, it's not where you want your compost. You want your compost to be hitting 150, but it's very vi clearly visibly not ready. I can't sift it. I can't strain it. So what I'm going to end up doing is gathering a bunch of fresh green material and combining it at a one-to-one -one ratio and making a new pile out of it. And it's going to take a lot of green material, but I've got a lot of it available. 
and uh, with the season ending, there'll be even more. As my sunflowers wind down, there's some, and I, I just throw it through the chipper shredder and mix it in, and it'll be all nice nitrogen content. Uh, in the back there, you could see all that green material, and it's all mine. I can strip any of it down that I'd like and use any of that nitrogen available, and whatever I use pops up again by next year. This is I had that mode last year, and this is one year of growth with back there not the tree line but up to the tree line all of that greenery there and so a lot of it I'm letting it do its natural thing I'm letting them go to seed and disperse because all of this ground here let me show you what I'm working with look at this that's rock hard concrete essentially it's heavy clay soil mixed with, with sand, which as a concrete expert would tell you is what it takes to make concrete. And so this right here, completely solid and hard packed. Uh, clay is very nutrient dense, but there's very little organic matter in there to hold moisture. And so it doesn't hold the moisture. The moisture can't get into the small particles very well and it just sits there. It doesn't penetrate through it, but it also doesn't absorb it well. And so I need to allow this green material to just build up over time and add layer upon layer and just till it into the soil. And that will improve all of this clay soil and turn it into topsoil that is rich and dark and, and nutrient dense and productive. And so a lot of this, you can see things that I've let go to grass seed uh, that is intentional in most places. Uh, I try and cut out any noxious weeds before they get to seed, if I see them in time. But the grasses here, are act that's actually a Bermuda, a Bermuda grass that is going to seed, that is hopefully going to spread in the areas that I have around here. Eventually this will all become actual planted area. Uh, you'll, you'll see it evolve over time in the same way that I have these two raised beds here. And these beds are worthy of their own video as well, of, as so many things in gardening are. Uh, as a basic summary, they are a hugel culture bed with wood. It's, it's dug about two feet down into the clay here uh, in a grave-like shape. It's three foot by six foot beds for the strawberry patches that allows 18 full-size plants. And then I trim out the babies. And uh, I have beans planted throughout them because I told you I just threw beans literally everywhere where I had available space. And so there's a wall of beans, but under them there's strawberries that are flourishing. And I don't want the strawberries to try and produce right now. I planted them kind of late this year. I'm intending for them to give me a good crop next year. Uh, and so all of this was planted in advance for next year. And these beans will help add some carbon into the soil through their roots. And they'll break down after winter. You know, I'll, I'll cut them down to the ground after, you know, they start to die out and leave the roots in the ground, and that will eventually break down and become food for the other, you know, the strawberry roots. Uh, they'll have little nitrogen nodules in them that, as many legumes do, to uh, add nitrogen into the soil. And they're, they'll also, you know, kind of protect and insulate the plants as they're growing up here. But... As I have this bed, or these beds here, I'm going to add more beds. I'm going to have some Hugel culture mounds that are not raised beds with walls. And I'm going to add more natural border beds. Uh, notice this long bed here. This is actually a series of logs. These logs I cut down from my own property because they were in the way of this garden. They had to come down. And in doing so, I used the trunk. And if you look not to swing you around too, right, too wildly here. But if you look here, I have a tree on its side there that I can cut into pieces. And there's a couple more there. And all along the border, there's a line of trees that just got pushed along the edge and will eventually all be consumed either as borders or underneath as a, a hugel culture substrate. And so none of it's going to waste. I'm not just burning it. I'm not releasing the carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, it rots for the first year or two and breaks down. And in doing in that time frame, if I had it in soil, it would be leaching nitrogen out of the soil. By letting it decompose above ground, that's not happening here. And so then once it gets a little soft and 
spongy and kind of flaky, you can just use that directly as the bottom. I used that in the bottom of this bed here, and you can see there's the uh, Hugo Culture substrate, and then for about six inches above that is fresh yard clippings, stuff that hadn't had a chance to break down, and then the, the last like eight or ten inches is actual compost, half sifted, half not sifted, and I have a video about planting this, about planting your fall garden, and that's going to come out very soon, and also on filling raised beds on the cheap because efficiency and cost is one of my number one driving things. And so I did not spend a dime on the infrastructure of this bed. The bed itself was donated to me by a friend, uh, Haskell or Ziggy, uh, and I filled it with woody material that a landscape friend donated to me as saving him cost from having to dump it off at the dump. And all of this, the, the, the fresh lawn clippings at the bottom that I mentioned, the woody material, uh, let me show you something here. Around around my sunflower bed, this border of stumps, all of those were a tree that were cut down by this landscaper friend that I keep mentioning, and he brought them to me. And all of the ones that were of you know, a nice uniform height of good for this wall around my sunflower and zinnia garden, I used for this to wall it off because people kept trying to walk through that while it was growing. And so I, I have that walled off, and then any that didn't fit there, or once I completed it, uh, they got put in the bottom of that bed over there. Nothing goes to waste. We use the whole buff. We use the whole buffalo around here. Uh, even in the, the bottom of the sunflowers, you could see the carrots that I mentioned, more radicchio, and even some uh, even some black seeded Simpson, or Samson, even some black seeded Samson lettuce that has popped up on its own there. That's that light color, and there's more of it back there that real bright light color and a, a one small behind it and all of those i had lettuce growing in this area in the spring early spring i planted some of that and i let it go to seed as i mentioned and so those have those have scattered in various places here and are now popping up amongst some of the other weeds and so i can identify what are the grass what are some other weeds here i may not even be able to identify all of my weeds here but I know what's a weed or what is something that I've intentionally planted because I pay attention to the seedlings when they pop up. And some look strikingly similar, and so you let those live until you know good enough what it is. And some, it may be okay. Uh, a lot of brassicas look all right, and you may think it's the broccoli that you planted, but it's actually a collard green that blew in off the wind from your garden up, up earlier and you didn't know. But either way, you're getting a brassica growing there, and you'll recognize it soon enough, and you're getting something in that spot. Uh, you'll be lacking in the broccoli department if you're relying on that one, but that's why you don't just rely on that one. Oh, wow. Wow. Look at that. This is the first one that's bloomed. It's kind of the smallest of the bunch here and uh, is blooming early. And I actually... I, I had a large sunflower that was multi-branching blooming, but it's an ornamental variety and has small flower heads and small hard seeds not great for eating it was just more for the fun colors and i don't want it to cross pollinate all of these culinary ones i'm quite positive i'm quite positive this one has already been cross pollinated and so i won't save the seeds from this one i'll just eat the seeds from this one i should mark it as such so that i know but I'll be able to save seeds from any of the rest because I've gotten rid of any other blooming sunflowers that are not a large culinary monohead. I have three different varieties, and if they breed with each other and I get weird mutants between them, that's fine. They should still all have giant heads and giant kernels. and So I'm, I'm okay if they cross-pollinate amongst each other and I get some cool hybrids out of it but I don't want them to cross-pollinate with these tiny-headed, multi-branching ornamentals. But yeah, this has just pretty much been a tour of the garden. It's, I'm running out of some daylight here, so I'll show you a couple more things. Uh, this right here is the cantaloupe patch. You can see a nice large cantaloupe there, a couple other small ones, and as it's getting cool, some of these might not finish. You can see a bunch of them in there. Look at those. 
And so some of them may not finish, and that's a reality that I acknowledge. Same with this cucumber vine. I'm seeing some vine wilt from the cucumber beetles. Uh, they, inf they get a bacterial infection and spread it, they suck it, and those leaves just die and drop off. But it's quite prolific, and so I'll do all right. I've already harvested an arm armload of cucumbers here, and you can see there's a couple in here that are on they'll be ready in a couple days, and it's making a ton more. And so with it getting warmer again in the next week or two, I'm hopeful the cucumbers will pull through and continue to produce for another couple weeks, and I'll get enough to make a bunch of pickles. I don't like cucumbers, but I love pickles. <laughs> uh, you can see these ones here are taller now than I am. This is my height, and they got that much on me. These are uh, some are titans, some are mammoth striped sunflowers in this back row here. Got a seed starting tray. A bunch of these need to get put in the little plants. Some of them are actually starts for next year. Uh, some peppers that I'm going to overwinter in the shed. Running out of daylight. Uh, and I've got some more beans planted over here. As you can see. Just look at those. Roll that beautiful bean footage right there. Those bright purple colors. Those cook out, but they help you with the identification of the uh, the plant. Uh, here I've got some oregano next to them. And some strawberries planted in compost in these beds. This isn't their permanent position. I'm, I'm not going to have this plastic as part of my permanent garden fixture here. This is just to... I, I was getting entirely too many runners in my primary plot and needed to put the runners somewhere and this served as a good place to put the runners while I work on getting other plots available for them and other soil and, and planters available and so this is just a temporary thing if it makes it through the, the end of the year into next spring and I can place them early next spring I will be ecstatic and then I'll probably dispose of the uh, plastic here or recycle it I should say uh, I don't like throwing away. My wife gets on me about that a lot. I don't throw away. I, I reuse or recycle anything in any way I can. And uh, so I have a lot of things around that look like junk to other people. Uh, all of these bags are not trash. They're compostable material, almost like cardboard for putting down over fresh beds. It's how I created the strawberry, the sunflower and cucumber bed over there. Uh, I lined pretty thick with those bags. My my landscaper friend brings me bag after bag after bag, and so I put them to use it as substrate as I build beds. And they make a, a weed retention layer at the bottom, and then I build. I add compost on top of that. Let me turn on night. Sh there we go. It's getting too dark for the regular, so I apologize for the shift to, to night camera mode, but it'll have to do for now. But you can see, it's. The, uh, in fact, I can show you right here. This right here is part of the, the brown paper. But it's just falling apart here as it's rotting away and, and composting. And so that, or the paper, uh, after I, I cut the grass very low, I put the paper on top, I covered the paper with compost, I plant, it was about six or eight inches of compost all, all across the whole way down. This whole line did not exist prior to this year. This was not a, a garden bed prior to this year. This is I actually installed this. Uh, my wife and I went to Michigan in August, and just before we went to Michigan for four or five days, I built this that day and dropped the. I I'd germinated the cucumbers in little six cell planters, and they had popped up the like the day before we left on this uh, vacation. 
So I, I went out and built this, and the sunflowers were popping up too. I had, germ I had put things in the ground to germinate, thinking they would take, you know, two weeks, and uh, kept them in a, a moisture tent. But they popped up way sooner than they were expected, right before we went on vacation. I'm glad it was that instead of after we got back and they were leggy and damaged. But I put them in the ground, built it that day, and that was in August. And so here it is, mid to late September, you know, a week until the end of the month, and they're flourishing i'm getting cucumbers even now and i'm hoping they continue like i said for a couple weeks i i'm giving you all this tour it's just a brief tour of what i've got going on and i have as i'd mentioned another plot that way right there uh just off you know just by the fence and you'll see that soon uh there's not a lot going in right there i've got tomatoes that have not made tomatoes in a month i've just kind of let them sit I'd rather have something growing there than nothing, and so I've let useless tomatoes that aren't producing anything sit there. Uh, but I'm going to pull them soon and start a fall garden there, uh, plant some brassicas and other fall to winter garden crops. and uh, But that'll be its own video. But it is getting late, as you can tell. Let me... As you can tell, see, this is how it looks without this here infrared and this is with plus three exposure the the sun is all but down but with infrared hey i'm lit right up nice little feature here uh but I, i'll cut the garden tour short there and i just i want to show this to lend some credence because I'm, I'm just showing up here i'm new on the gardening scene and you, ha you haven't seen what i have and what i have to offer unless you know you know me personally and I'm hoping I'll expand beyond just people that know me personally. So I just wanted to give you a tour of the garden to get a little insight into how I operate, how my garden's looking. You can see it's not a pristine, perfect garden, say from the front of a garden magazine. But most of us don't have time for that or the resources to pull that off. And so what I'm showing you is a way to pull it off with next to no cost as long as you have some natural resources available or can network to get them and the ways I'll show you to do it don't require a lot of resources and the resources they do require after the tools required to do the jobs the resources themselves should be able to be provided by your, the land itself in most cases or you should be able to network to get the extra materials that you require. Networking is a big part of being successful in life, in the garden, in the workplace. And this friend that I've mentioned multiple times, he is a, uh, a retired vet. He used to be a DBA, a database administrator in the IT field, same as myself. Uh, I didn't know him from that, but I, just, I found that out after I met him. Uh, I didn't know him prior to my gardening. He is a friend of my neighbor across the street, and they were hanging out, and they were looking at my garden and, and looking at all the stuff that I do, and I mentioned how I have a shortage of yard material for composting, how I just can't get it fast enough. And he said, hey, what now? Because here he was with a truckload of compost every day that he would go down and pay ten dollars you know four or five days a week to dump a load of compost at the dump maybe not that often but at peak time it definitely could be and so I'm telling him hey I will take all of your yard waste trees that you cut down sure branches sure grass clippings especially uh, if it used to be alive and organic green matter bring it and so he's he's brought me so 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 much since and that was only uh this spring that i met him uh, it, through my neighbor across the street just by networking and mentioning i have this need and he goes well i have this excess would you like it for free delivered every you know whenever i have it absolutely and so you don't have somebody like that or you probably don't have somebody like that yet I didn't, when I started, I didn't even look for him. But now that I know he exists, I imagine there are thousands of other people just like him out there paying at dumps all across the country, all across the world, or having to offload it in various places. 
and they would be tickled to have someone around them use it and put it to use. You could buy your own compost, and there's some places, some municipalities, that allow you to pick up as much compost as you want. I don't have a good means of transporting that much compost. I would have to invest in a lot of totes. We have SUVs. I don't have a truck. The SUV doesn't have a trailer hitch. And so I don't have a good way currently of moving bulk substrate material like that. And that's been a bane of my existence since I've been gardening. Uh, the next vehicle I get when I do have spare funds, who knows when that'll be, will be a truck specifically so that I can go and pick up things like wood chips or compost from places that have it, you know, available. Hopefully I won't need to buy compost in the future. I, I have my, my one friend that I've mentioned, uh, and I'd like to network and make others. I, I A couple other people have brought me tree clippings, but not yard clippings. And yard clippings are really the hot stuff <laughs> for composting. Uh, the 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 greens in there are just so nitrogen rich they let your pile heat up appropriately to make sure that any weed seeds and pathogens are killed. I just I don't have enough area in my yard here to get enough greens to build huge compost but with him doing all these commercial jobs and coming in with 30 gallon bag after 30 gallon bag of material it makes it a lot more efficient for me to be able to make a ton of compost and I use it in everything. I use it in planters, I use it in raised beds, I use it on top of culture mounds, uh, directly on the surface, and I have all of these in place. The uh, sunflower zinnias, I didn't have a ton of compost available, and I didn't plant them directly in compost. All of that was topsoil amended with a cup, an inch or two in various places of compost thrown on top and then raked in in place. And they're doing great. I scattered some 10... I scattered some 10-10-10 fertilizer on top and raked that in as well. And, you know, I stand by my original comments on using fertilizers. They don't have to be organic. It, it, it comes down to the same base nutrients. Uh, that being said, if you can make a perfect, pristine, nutri nutrient-rich compost with food that, you know, fruits and veggies and flowers and greens and plants and stems and everything and it breaks down and you keep it moist and you turn it and it, it turns into some of the best, the best richest compost, the, the best potting material you could imagine. In those cases you don't need to amend it. It has everything it could possibly want. Anything you throw in there is just a waste, at least for the first few grows through it. Uh, nutrients will deplete and you've got to keep adding compost and every so often I'll take a couple scoops out of the beds whenever I for example whenever I harvested the Roma tomatoes I took about a five gallon bucket or two of compost or of the existing compost that was in the bed that I grew in last time and threw that in a new compost pile that I was making and filled up that bit with actual new fresh live compost and mixed it all in throughout evenly and the stuff in there now is flourishing and, and just it's growing real thick but also real lively and it's not over planted at all it's growing as thick as it likes to grow there uh, that's a, a big part I, I've adopted that mindset from square foot gardening square foot gardening aims to get the most use out of the the available square footage as possible. You break down your available space into one foot by one foot tiles and then you choose the plants you would like to plant and you put them into this tile and each plant has a set number associated with it and that number tells you how many to plant. For example, turnips are nine. So in the one square foot you plant a three by three dot 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 in that one, you know, just a centered, like the dots on a dice uh, with nine of them, and you plant those turnips in there. And they will grow thick, but that's enough space for the turnips, and they've done a lot of research into it. And it generally grows well as long as your soil is rich enough, but many times, especially depending on the variety you grow, the plants can get too big for that space, and so they either get stunted, and you end up with diminished products and not efficient use of seeds, 
or they will outcrowd and outgrow their space and so other ones around them suffer. And so I, having experimented with square foot gardening, I see its benefits, especially if you are extremely limited in space. People growing in a, a balcony, they could do a square foot gardening approach where they get, you know, if they've got this 30 square foot space and that's only a 10 foot by three foot section, you could theoretically put two one foot fabric grow plots that whole length and still have a foot that you could walk up and down it and tend to them and that gives you 20 square foot of gardening space which is enough to grow almost an absurd amount of food with the square foot gardening approach as long as you tend to it well and use this especially what they call oh you hear that bullfrog uh, if you use what they call Mel's mix and Mel is the guy who came up with the, the, the idea of square foot gardening. He was an engineer who took to gardening and was just like, there's got to be a more efficient way than these rows with all these spaces and this empty, unused, hard-packed dirt. What are we doing? And so he revolutionized it with a square foot gardening approach, and it works. It works fantastically. But it's not the only way to go about, and I like a little bit more of an organic structure. As I said, when this past bed, when I first planted it, I strictly adhered to square foot gardening. And most things outgrew their space. And that was okay. And the whole goal is to plant practically more than the ground can support. Because when you do that, the canopy is so thick, and I mentioned this earlier in the video, weeds cannot grow up in it. And so you're not having to go out and weed every day or even every week. I have done almost no weeding on that whole long garden bed. Whereas the sunflower zinnia bed, which is planted directly in topsoil, uh, which is low on the ground and infested with seeds and not done with six inches of compost, I have to do a lot of weeding and pull up a lot of grass and a lot of nuisance pest plants from that area. It's not planted as thickly. Things are spaced. The sunflowers need room. And so it's what you're going to expect there. I should have mulched thicker, and I probably will go back and mulch soon, but even that's not infallible. Mulching drastically cuts down on the weeds in the space, and it also greatly reduces your watering requirements. I highly recommend mulching, and around my largest sunflowers there, and the ones that I mentioned that were putting out side roots, I absolutely mulched a couple inches thick there to cover the roots, and then mound out around the sides. But I don't have enough mulch to cover all of my square footage here. And that's part of my blessing and curse is I have a large plot of land for being in the city. It's almost three acres. It's 2.75 acres of land, uh, 300 foot across, 400 foot wide. And I'm, I'm saying all that not to brag, but to explain my space here. Uh, I have a 50 foot by 25 foot pond behind me that's 0.1 acres of my 2.75 acres house or property. Uh, my house and fence are another maybe 0.1 or point, uh, they're about 0.25 acres probably for the house and fenced area. And so that leaves most of this other space, but at least half of it is densely wooded with pine and oak, a lot of it old growth. But that gives me a unique resource that a lot of other people might not have in a small city space. I can go and cut down a tree and use its log, cut it into four foot sections and maneuver them in place and build raised beds and it won't cost me a dime for the walls. Whereas some people might not have that option and will have to either buy cinder blocks, but be careful because those can leach the, uh, the alkalines into the soil and make your soil rather base and you may have to acidify them some. Uh, uh, you might have to, and that, that's just one way to do a raised bed. Uh, you could buy pressure treated wood, modern pressure treated wood will be fine. You don't want to use old repurposed farm wood from like the 70s. Uh, it could have lead paint, it could have other heavy metals and other bad things in it uh, that you don't want to leach in. And they were chemically treated back then with, you know, those same heavy metals and various things that they knew would keep insects out, but it also will leach into your food over time and you don't want that. Uh, so modern pressure day treated wood, wood will be fine. Uh, that's what those strawberry beds are back there that you saw. Alternatively, 
You can do a wooden frame with metal roofing sheets between them and have really tall raised beds like my tub raised bed back there. Uh, that tub has holes in the bottom to allow water to flow through and so it would be the same as just building up a real tall frame to hold the, the metal in and you would want the metal to be on the inside of the wooden frame secured to it so that as it pushes it can't push through and you would need you know various bracing throughout it experimentally of course but I say all of that to say I have access to materials that suit my purpose for free all I have to do is go out and work for it and you'll see videos of that I'll cut down some trees and harvest the wood for material to make raised beds to fill raised beds with Google culture wood in the bottom sometimes to make raised posts I have an idea I have a horseshoe bed over here that's a Hugel culture mound and that literally just is it means hill culture or you know growing in a hill and you build the hill with a wood base fallen stumps logs branches and then a hummus layer of partially broken down compost hay straw I use bales of hay and straw from the feed store and line that and then topped with compost and you plant directly in that and those are supposed to stay nutrient dense for 20 years the the wood takes a long time to break down and holds materials and nutrients and you just continuously add you add a, a, a layer of compost and plant in it and then the next season you add a layer of compost and plant in it and so you're getting here uh, all of this keeps coming down to this compost and I say all of this video this tour of the garden to stress how important composting is and it's not just saving your kitchen scraps it's every time you mow your lawn get a, a lawn mower that bags your lawn clippings and make the effort to empty the bag into a receptacle and whenever that receptacle is full you know try and get a, a, a I have a trash can with wheels and I fill it with the, the grass clippings and I wheel it to the compost pile that I'm making and all of that is nice fresh greens and so I'm hoping to whet your thirst for composting with this video because I, I promised a composting video as my next video but I feel like this is is a better more relevant one because you need to see why you need to make your own compost and I, I hope to instill that thirst for it here I use so much of it here it, you can plant anything in it this compost is worth it, it, it's it's literally black gold you it, it turns into whatever your favorite produce is whatever money you're spending at the grocery stores spend a dollar fifty or three dollars on a patch a pouch of seeds and throw it in your own home grade homegrown compost tend it for a little bit sprinkle a little water on it and now suddenly you're getting hundreds of dollars of produce from it and thousands of more seeds that each can grow their own plant that grow a, a oodles of produce one of my Roma tomato plants produced probably 15 pounds of tomatoes it was it was weighed down and it knocked the, the tomato cage down and it was still just producing I, I pulled all of the, the ones that were ready and the next day there was another like 40 or 50 tomatoes ready and that was one of my plants and I had like 15 planted in that area in a, a I it was actually you know a four by it was 16 originally and one of them died and so that was a four foot by four foot area that produced well over 70 pounds of Roma tomatoes square foot gardening has its merits but that area was well overgrown beyond its four square foot or its four by four grid area it was at least two feet out in any direction and huge vertically and so you have to keep that in mind if you are truly limited in space and but at the very least you can always grow your own greens and cut down on that cost cut down on having to go to the grocery store so often uh, part of my problem with going to the grocery store is we go and we spend on so many other things but if you have the thing the makings for a salad here you just step outside and you cut your salad and you cut it come in and you have it 
There's no spending. There's no going down and being tempted and buying and seeing all this other, oh, we need that too, we need that too, we need that too. And you get what you want when you want it. It's fresh. You know, if you buy a salad at the grocery store, and that, that, that romaine lettuce, it's good for four or five days, maybe, maybe a week. And that's if it didn't come with listeria or E. coli or any of the other slew of food poisoning things that they keep recalling this stuff for. And so you have to go every couple days to keep getting it fresh. Or keep a garden and just every week or two scatter a couple seeds in a fresh area that, that you, ha you don't have planted or that you're pulling plants from. Once it's a substantial size garden and I mention, you know, the, the person who's only gardening on their terrace, and my advice will be helpful for them too. But that is not who I am aiming to help, unfortunately. Uh, I will gladly help you, and I'll gladly, you know, help answer any questions you have and considerations you may have. And I may be so inspired if I get enough support that I might try a simple mock terrace garden to see what can be done in a small st square footage like that on a balcony but as of right now I'm not pursuing that niche I've got plenty of space here I've got room to expand my limiting factor is my available compost and my ability to turn the compost piles because when you do have a lot of large piles and they're all going at the same time it's a lot of work to turn these piles two or three times a week which is what it can take at its peak to get to do the uh, the Berkeley 18-day composting method, which I'll talk about in the future. Uh, to do that, you've got to turn the pile every two days. And if you are running three or four large piles at a time, like I've done in the past, that is four hours of pile turning every two days. <laughs> And that's not easy work. I don't have heavy equipment. I don't have a windrow machine that'll come and turn it all and filter it for me. I've got a wood chipper, but I don't want to throw this dank, you know, musty, hot, moist stuff in my wood chipper shredder. It would probably shred it, but it would get gunked up and sticky on the inside, and that's just a pain. And so I just got to turn it by hand and let nature take its course let the bacteria do its thing and break it down but it's getting late and I've rambled enough here I'm gonna go ahead and uh, work on e ending this video here uh, but again I just I wanted to give the status of my garden show a tour of it and mention some of the different practices that I'll be touching on I, I mentioned all this briefly in my introduction video but I didn't let you see what's happening here. I didn't walk around and show you the garden just because I wanted to get it quick and out and nitty-gritty, say what I needed to say, and introduce myself to the channel. But now here I am, so it's time to see the garden, and I'm hoping to whet your appetite for this composting series, and I'm actually going to release not just a single long composting video, but I'm going to break it up into a few different sections and have each video be clearly identified with the, the goal and purpose of that video because somebody who's just looking to make compost may not know or may not care to hear all of the nitty gritty the nitty gritty details of the ins and outs and intricacies they want to know how to get started how to jump into it and so I'll have that video but I will also have the video where I talk a lot more in depth and also ones where I, I demonstrate making it both starting a new pile as well as turning piles. Uh, I'll, I have a video where I actually I filmed it while it was raining. It had been raining all day at various degrees. It, it was a downpour for over an hour, and then it got softer, and we had a break in the rain. So I came out to, fill, or to film turning the compost pile and why you can't rely on the, the rain, and it was completely bone dry after just an, less than an inch through. And so even though it had been raining all day, not a drop of water had permeated through the compost pile. And so you've got to dissect it, break it apart with a, a turning fork, and insert water into it. The act of turning it in, inserts oxygen into it, and then you you have to manually add this moisture. And you can't just turn it and then add the water, because the same thing will happen. You'll spray it down, and it'll form a shell on the outside, 
and little pieces of straw will stick together and form that shell and now none of that water is getting through and it's just running off the sides and so you've got to break it apart and spray and break it apart and spray and break it apart and spray but I'll cover all of that in detail uh, I'm I've got a lot of content planned here I've got a whole series like I said planned for making compost uh, why you should worry about making it why it matters and how to source materials because like I said my friend is not the only person in, in his predicament and so all you have to do then is network and call and find landscape companies and ask them hey what do you do with your land your lawn clippings when you're done uh, also if, you know if you get any leads and they, they have the potential of using them that's when you want to find out hey are you using things like Roundup? You don't want lawn clippings, especially shortly after they spray Roundup and, and, and all those other chemicals. Uh, I find if they're using something like a... Uh, in, in my experience, and I don't want to swear this is the law, but I've, I've composted material after a, uh, a weed and feed, a broadleaf herbicide was used I did not compost the dying stuff there uh, you know they, they chopped and dropped or I guess I, I chopped and dropped and, and everything that was killed by the herbicide was dropped in place but then on the next run when the grass grew I composted that grass after the weed and seed and uh, everything that I planted in the, the compost afterwards was fine they say you can plant beans in the compost and test it, and if it germinates and sets its first set of true leaves fine, and those true leaves don't wilt, then the compost is good and you can plant in it. Uh, I didn't even do a bean test because what I was actually intending to grow was beans, but they all grew beautifully. I showed you some of them earlier, the ones in the uh, totes, the, the blue totes with the, uh, the grow bags. The, all that compost was from after using a, uh, a weed and feed. And, uh, like I said, I didn't include the ones that died from the weed and feed. All of those just got mowed down and dropped in place. But then the grass afterwards was fine to use. And so he's brought me that grass multiple times, you know, from the, that, the people. And uh, I haven't had any issues. Uh, there may be other herbicides out there that could be a problem or insecticides if they're applying them he is you know these the, the, his clients soul gardener they're not getting other people out who are applying chemicals they're not not out applying their own chemicals and he's not putting any dangerous insecticides or herbicides or anything out there just a few he's used pre-emergent weed killers and also the uh, broadleaf weed, weed killers and I have composted after both of them and it's been fine hello Hi. you feel me yeah Say you're gonna have to bid the viewers a good evening because you're gonna about to take your wife out. Oh, okay. I, I don't know where we're going yet, so this is a, an utter surprise to me now. Uh, but uh, you heard the lady. Uh, I, I'm gonna have to cut this video short. I hope I've whet your uh, appetite for the composting videos to come, and I hope you like what you've seen with the garden. If you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to leave them below. If you have not liked the video or subscribed to our channel. Take a chance to do so now. Uh, until the next video, good afternoon.